Hello, I'm Dr. Louise Newson, and welcome to my podcast. I'm a GP and menopause specialist, and I run the Newson Health Menopause and Wellbeing Centre here in Stratford upon Avon. I'm also the founder of the Menopause Charity and the Menopause Support App called Balance. On the podcast, I will be joined each week by an exciting guest to help provide evidence-based information and advice about both the perimenopause and the menopause. I've got someone back for the second time, actually, Lorraine Candy, who I've known for a few years now and the work she's done vocally and behind the scenes to help more menopausal women be empowered with information has been very phenomenal and exciting. So welcome, Lorraine, today to the podcast. Oh, it's lovely to be back. I love talking to you about this because I think it's always helpful, isn't it, for people? Of course it is. So you do your own podcast and I know when I'm on other people's podcasts, it's it's a bit weird being the other yes. side of the fence almost, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Yeah, it is. But I am sort of on a book tour, so I'm kind of in that mode at the moment. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, you just don't let me interview well, you. Gonna... That's the main thing. <laughs> Yes, well, I talk about your book in a bit, um, your new book that's just come out, What's Wrong With Me. But before that, you've not always been an author and a podcast person, have you? Um, no. Just, I'm really keen to hear how you got into what you're doing. And I know with lots of things, including myself, it's your own experiences that shape what you do. And I think that's probably it's a bit sexist maybe maybe more for women as well actually I could not do the work I'm doing if I wasn't a menopausal woman who struggled to get help and yeah. you probably I don't think you could write your books if you never had children or well, you might have done but they yeah. wouldn't be nearly as good so I'm sure so so tell me a bit about how you've come to doing what you do well just in context of my background so I grew up in a very small village in Cornwall went to a local comprehensive um always wanted to edit magazines and be a journalist um spent my life in the library basically the local library I won a writing award when I was mm. 16 and doing my GCSEs about to do my A levels and um that got me a little bit of work experience on the local paper so I went and did some work experience over the summer on the Cornish Times and I just thought you know I'm not academically gifted what's the point of doing A-levels? I might as well take this job and then I'll be able to get on a paper in London. And I came up to London the following year when I was 17. So I then worked as a journalist and I worked on The Sun, um, The Times, I was featured editor on The Times and The Daily Mirror and a newspaper called Today. And I kind of learnt my skills as a journalist then and that's where mm. I learned to write. But my main interest was women's stories and, and, you know, telling women's stories. And when I started, I did a lot of stuff around, I interviewed the first woman um, who took her husband to court for marital rape. I interviewed um, one of the women whose uh, imprisonment after she killed her husband uh, after years of domestic violence was awful, Sarah Thornton. And I interviewed her in prison and we did a campaign that changed it all. So all through the beginning of my journalism, it's always been about women's stories. And then I moved on to edit Cosmo. Um, and also L, where I stayed for 12 years and then Sunday Times style. So throughout that whole time, my writing really has been very focused on women. And obviously, when you edit a magazine, you have a community of, of, of women around you who come with you and grow mm. up with you. So I've a, had a huge mm. community of Gen X women, basically. And when I hit perimenopause, well, two things happened. When I hit my mid 40s and my children became teenagers, I thought this is really unusual why are teenagers so awful and what's what can possibly be going on I better find out and obviously you know what is going on is their brains being taken apart and put back together again they're full mm -hmm. of hormones all sorts of things are happening so I wrote a parenting book on why this you shouldn't be ambushed by this and there are some very small simple easy ways of parenting that will make everyone's life easier I tried mm -hmm. to make it funny and at the same time I was obviously going through what I found out was perimenopause. <laughs> so I thought, I don't understand why I'm ambushed by this when I've been writing, you know, probably specialising in health, mental health as a, as a journalist, and I had mm. not heard the term. And I just couldn't see how it could be fair of me not to put that into a book. And at the same time, I was um, chatting to a friend of mine, Trish Halpern, who edited Marie Claire Red and In Style. And we'd known each other 25 years and we were going through exactly the same thing, exchanging WhatsApps on our, can, did we have a brain tumour? Mm. Perhaps we had dementia. Maybe these palpitations were to do with heart disease. Maybe we had all these things, but neither of us mm. knew that we were going through the perimenopause. So 
once we found that out, we thought, well, well why don't we do this new podcasting thing that everyone's doing? Because <laughs> it's easy, it's something to chat, easier to chat about. And also, I couldn't, as I said to you at the time, I couldn't get any stories in the papers about menopause and perimenopause. The editors just didn't yeah. want to read it. But they still, were, yeah. yeah, very mm-hmm. against it. So we set up postcards from midlife because we thought it's, you know, midlife is about more than just menopause and perimenopause. It's really a hugely transformational stage of life. And there's so much change. We'll just talk to all the experts. And we sort of rang all our friends, um, kind of celebrities we dealt with. And, and women were desperate to come and talk about this stage of life. They'd mm. never been asked about it. <laughs> you know, we didn't have to say you're going to have to talk about perimenopause and menopause. We said, can you come on and talk about, you know, getting into your 40s and 50s? And they said, brilliant. And we were getting so many new stories. And we realised they, they just hadn't been asked about this stage of life. Women were kind of invisible. So that's kind of the context of where where I sit now. Um, podcasting. It's, really, it's very interesting, isn't it? I mean, I never understood, because I was never taught the psychological impact of menopause but I was also never taught how hard it was to have teenage children and no. you're absolutely right when it's all happening together as women this is a generalization of course but certainly my personality is I blame myself if things aren't right yeah I don't look at others and think maybe it's them it's like well my daughter's team shouting at me that's my fault I'm a bad mother rather than actually there's things going I, on I with her I think that was the overwhelming and, and, thing this shame this is why the previous generation i can only Mm. conclude this is why the previous generation haven't talked to us about it because they feel a bit ashamed so you slightly lose your confidence and then you feel ashamed of the things that you're going through have you looked after your parents well enough now they're beginning to get ill is are the whole family getting on is is Mm. are you a good enough parent you you must not be because you've created this terrible person (laughs) but that's that's just what teenagers are like well well, i think so and your your book uh you know what's Mummy is what's wrong with you. It was was amazing because actually, I remember you've got it's all about choosing your battles, isn't it? But it was, you know, you were saying about piercings and tattoos. Yes. And at the time I read it, my children only had the conventional two piercings and no tattoos. Moving forwards a few years, um, especially my older daughter's got quite a few tattoos, and both of them have got more, certainly more than two piercings. And I'm actually really relaxed about it. And it's probably partly thanks to you, Lorraine, because I thought actually the bigger picture, does it matter? They're expressing themselves. That, that's their choice. Yeah. And I often say to my 18-year-old, I have no control over you. I hope I've given you morals and values that you can pull on. But it's up to you what you do. Of course it is. And yeah. it's having that ability, but you have to have a lot of mental strength to do that. And you have to have a lot of um, ability to still be in control from afar, but... It, it, it's it's all mind games a lot of this but if your mind isn't working properly usually yes. affected by not having hormones it's really difficult and yeah. women then set themselves up to fail and i think also this whole invisibility i some of you might have heard the podcast i've done with or joanne harris and how society wants people to be invisible and i think what you're doing what i'm doing what others are doing are allowing women to have a voice and there's all this thing isn't there it's very even again a generalization journalists are quite paternalistic they'll tell you what they think the audience want to hear so i remember when we when we first met face to face you were writing this article weren't you for sunday Mm. times star magazine and you almost had to get it in in a different way but actually women are desperate to be unlocked Mm. and to have this platform where you know it's almost like the celebrities don't want to show that they're being old, but actually others want to know how, even if you've got all the money and all the fame and all everything else, you can still struggle. And these, this is what's helped you. And I think that's with your podcast has really helped, isn't it? You're having yeah. quite high profile people having normal stories. We all go through the same you know, we all go through some form of changes at this stage of life. We all lose our collagen and, and our mm-hmm. muscle mass. And so we're all experiencing it. And you, But you do need role models culturally in order to mm. see that it's not something that's happening to you alone. And, and actually, until the last five years, there have been no cultural role models. I mean, Joanne Harris' book, actually, mm. you know, because her... Um, the protagonist is a menopausal woman, isn't she? So you just, they haven't been in yes, books. They haven't yeah. been on TV. You know, we had Juliet Stevenson, um, the actress on the podcast, and she said that for ages she just couldn't tell people her age, not because she didn't want to, because she was grateful mm. to be ageing and, you know, not be ill, and, you know, not 
the alternative is so yes. awful to not aging but she said she couldn't because it limited mm. everything she would have done and actually she said her last four roles uh, one of whom she'd won an award for on on in theater had been the best roles of her life and she'd done the most amazing yes. work and and to take that away from women, as has been the case, you know, to, to only see older men able to marry younger women on screen in, in the big blockbusters, to mm. only see Marvel heroes who are under 40 unless they're male, is quite extraordinary. But now that is changing. I mean, it's it's slightly slower than we would hope, but it is changing. And women are in better positions of power to change that. But they know what they're talking about as well. So I think that's, you know, I think that's the interesting thing. When you've got older women talking about menopause and perimenopause that's really really helpful um and it also helps men shape the conversation as well as we know this country is a patriarchy they, the men are in the positions of power in most industries mm. they're on the board level in, in a way that women aren't in, in much bigger numbers so they need to know about it so they need to see it as well mm, i think it's so important and i think one of the things that certainly causing a lot of unrest certainly in the medical establishment with some of my work is because women patients are having information that they've never had before. So I was on a meeting this morning, actually, and someone was saying they really worry, these are GPs, we've just done a, some research with balance, how to, it can help the GP consultation, and it's shown that it can really help and be very beneficial. But some of the GPs are saying, well, we're really worried that women are self-diagnosing and they might miss other uh, diseases. So for example, if someone had palpitations, everybody should be referred to a cardiologist, have their heart checked before considering the menopause, or everybody with memory problems should have a brain scan to make sure they've not got a, a brain tumour. And it's like, no, hang on, let women decide, actually, because a lot of women know when they've been given the information. And of course, some people might have a brain tumour, of course, some people might have heart problems. But we can still think about the menopause as well and we can still self-diagnose mm. and we can still actually have treatment whether we need more investigations or not. And certainly for palpitations, if I referred everybody with palpitations yeah. to a cardiologist, the system would be flooded. But even if I did, just because some people obviously do still need to be referred but they started treatment at the same time, most people's palpitations melt away by the time they've got their appointment yeah. through. So we can work together. And I think with the menopause, it's always gone the other way that it's sort of them and us. And it's, it's causing this big divide actually with women sometimes, but also with, um, with medical professionals, because they see the menopause as a bit of a lifestyle problem. But actually we can work together. So patients can, and women can actually enable the conversation to get treatment earlier. Um, but also look at their whole future health and lifestyle as well. And, you know, it's not just about, do I just go and get a prescription? It's yeah. actually, where do I start my conversation to relook at my diet, my exercise, the way that I talk to my husband every night when he comes in from work, yeah. the way I manage my children if they're difficult. And, and piecing all that together is, is actually a huge thing. And I think the, one of the things that, with the yeah. podcast of the work you're doing is enabling people to have a bit of time for themselves actually is isn't it well also you know the the thing i you know with the new book i interviewed lots and lots of i mean i obviously interviewed you but i interviewed lots of women around the men, more mental health aspects of it so once you've got your hrt there is still a lot going on in midlife yes. you know it's not as you say it's not just physical and i just think women needed the language <laughs> no. to know that you know actually as a one of the therapists we had, um, I talked to, Julia Samuel, um, said there is a softening that needs to occur. Um, Gen mm. X women are very bad at it. We have a real endurance mindset. We have this do it all, have it all, you know, must be at home, must be at work, must do this, mm. must do that mindset generally. Um, but it, we get to this stage and all women just need to soften slightly, be more vulnerable so they can ask for help because you, you really can't do it on your own. And actually the help that you get is generally from, from other women, that kind of connection to other women in a similar situation. I've made an awful lot of new friends in midlife. Um, of women who are going a sim through a similar thing. I do a lot of swimming. I, I meet them sort of by lakes and rivers and seas and things. And we have a shared identity. And it's really helpful that they have bits of knowledge I don't have. But I only get that if I soften towards them and if I'm slightly more open and vulnerable. And I hadn't really thought of that, um, doing that or, mm. or that as part of the jigsaw. And I, th I do really think it is part of the jigsaw because it's not 
you know you're not going from a to b in midlife it's so much more squiggly and you can't see the road ahead i interviewed an amazing um woman for the book anonymously who shared a phenomenal story and she was saying that she just for ages you can see around the corner or you can see up ahead of you or <laughs> and then suddenly you just can't see anything you're just hitting the wall and you don't know what the next bit might be you don't know whether you're no going to be in the same marriage you don't know if you're going to live in the same country you, do, you just suddenly become such a giant change and you have no nothing to see ahead of you so unless you soften and get more vulnerable it's going to be a little harder to navigate it I think so and it's having the flexibility isn't it because there's so much more that's out of your control or oh, there certainly yeah. is in my life you know I think yeah. right I've just sorted this out perfect and then suddenly my daughter phones me and there's a problem all right okay you go from one thing to another and you have to pivot quite quickly when you've got... You do, it's <laughs> just, it feels... Issues. And they're not it's, small problems. That, so that, you know, they might, you know, no. when they were toddlers and you might have to go and pick them up from school because they had a rash or something like that. These are massive oh, things. Oh, easy? You know, and it, <laughs> though, you know it, the, people are dying as well around you. I mean, we kind of, you know, we, we mm. lose people at this stage of life. So we st mm. may be dealing with grief for the first time. We've, we're watching some mm. of our friends leaving marriages. We're watching our friends being made redundant. Mm. And all of this is happening and it mm. catches you unawares. And I don't think we talk enough about it. And we're... We don't want to portray it as a frightening, terrible time for women. We just want to say, you know, these all these things may happen. So, you know, get your head around it, get the language around it, get the support you need, and then you can be in a better place. Because in, in midlife, actually, I'm mm. the most confident, happy, calmest, healthiest I've ever been. And I think so, but I think you also have to be because you're dealing with so much more than you were before. So, so your new book, What's Wrong With Me, is very powerful and it does address so many so many more things which i think having tools to cope with more because more is fired at us as we've already said is really useful isn't it so why did you decide to write the book then Lorraine? well <laughs> we've done i think 120 interviews or something of, of, of women and experts on the podcast and all that information was there and i thought i better share that we should mm. share that um, and i didn't want to do the kind of you know you've written the the most brilliant medical helpful book on on you know physically and mentally what's going and i just thought it would be worth just pulling stories together other women's stories together so mm. you know the main drive for me was i just didn't want anyone to feel alone and i think that's the you know we we know that's the saddest most lost but you know you can be surrounded mm. by family but still feel terribly alone in midlife and i mm. think I don't want I, I we had spoken to so many women on the podcast and we have a private Facebook group who told us really, really sad stories and they felt so lonely. And I thought, well, let's just put it all together in a place so that there is, you know, you can dip in and dip out. And it's a bit funny in places, one, well, but you'll get this sense that the, it's not you going mad and that you're not alone, that there's a massive army of women going through it with you, which, you know, it's a little bit like childbirth, isn't it? I always remember when I was breastfeeding in the middle of the night and at my wits end because it didn't, you know, for my first two, it didn't really work very well. And I remember being up in the night thinking, at least I'm not on my own. I know millions of women are doing this <laughs> across the world. And there was mm. so much information out there for me. And I could join a baby group or I could go and meet, I could go and meet a woman who'd had a baby on the same day that I had, had the same problems with me. It was so accessible. But when I was waking up in the middle of the night covered in sweat with night terrors, I thought I was going mad. I was completely on my own. I thought this yeah. is... You know, I have some form of psychosis. As it turns out, there's an army of women waking up in the night with night terrors until they get mm. their HRT. So, you know, we're not alone. And I think that was my main thing for the book, that you don't have to feel like you're alone. There is a language out there that you can use. There's information out there. And other women, most, almost every woman over 40 is going through it with you. So that was the driver for me um mm. i can't say i enjoyed the process very much i'm not good at writing books i hate being tra trapped in a room <laughs> for a long time and i think the ladies at swiss scottish library were quite glad to see the back of me after a while <laughs> so it's a it's no mean feat writing a book is it it's no, hard it's grueling. i don't know if you're about me every time you reread a draft you think no i want to change it i want to change it and there's always things that you can perfect and improve and wish you'd done and but then it's here. You must be really proud of it, aren't you? I was really proud. We had the launch, um, a little party last night at Daunt's Books in Marlebone, And it's a really lovely bookshop that I've spent a lot of time in over the years. It's a little cult bookshop. And um, to see your own book in the window 
Um, mm. It's quite, it's just quite a, a wonderful thing, especially for someone, you know, because I was not academically great at school <laughs> and there were not high hopes for me to get to university. So to actually think that maybe, mm -hmm. you know, I never thought one day I'd be able to write a book and, and you know, it's here, it lives forever. You make a stamp on history. I'm part of a big conversation um, that women are having at the minute. So it was... I was actually really proud. I took one of my um, daughters, but she um, she went halfway through because she said, I, I need to bounce. It's boring in here, she says. <laughs> um, but it was, you know, I think it's so lovely for them to see that y you don't have any, mm. there is a different route to things um, in life as well that you don't, you know, I could, the jobs I've done haven't been reliant on me having a degree or being uber educated or, you know, just, it's just being a journalist is being curious. And I feel, you know, I was curious enough to find out more from other women, put it all in a book, and, and now it lives. And the um, cover of the book was just, it, it really did pull midlife women together. So the cover of the book is designed by an illustrator from the New York Times. She's uh, Amrita, she's Marino. She's amazing. And um, I had to have a chat with her about it to, for her to design it. She's a big, colourful illustrator. And ma then managed to get her to go and see a GP <laughs> in New York about... HRT because oh, she was in <laughs> she won't mind me saying she wanted to you know she need there's very little information in the states in the way that there is here so mm. I sort of feel like everywhere no. anyone involved you know my editor Louise who edited the first book with me is a woman in her 50s as well and you know we bonded over everything I talk about in the book so it, it feels like it was put together by friends for friends yeah and I made friends doing it. Yeah. So, you know, it feels like a very lovely thing to put out in the world. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? When I when my book came out, Yellow Kites, my publisher, and I went and did a presentation to them about the menopause. And um, there were, I don't know, 100 or so people in the mm. room. And then they, they did it on Teams as well. And I thought, everyone must know about it because it's my book. They must have prepared. And, and mm. still the questions asking, the tears in the audience, because it's yeah. that realisation that it's you. It's all there and it, it's, um, I think the more I work, the more I try and amplify my voice, but the more I realise there's lots of people that we're not reaching. Well, I, I spoke was, to a woman um, on Monday it... night. I did an event on Monday night with Christy Watson who wrote Quilt on Fire, which is about her midlife experience. She's 10 years younger. And a, and a lady came up to me at the end. She, she said she works for a big city bank. How could I, how, how could I advise her to stop the men in her office making fun of her when she had hot flushes? And I thought, oh, I've been doing talking about this now for, you know, we, Trish and I go and talk to corporations. And I said, but well, that is still happening. She said, oh, yeah, they, they, um, they, they'll open a window and say, oh, we're doing this for so-and-so because she's, look at her, she's flushing away over there. She said, they mock me and make fun of me. And she said, they, they do it in a kind of as if they're being friendly and in, in, including me. In their minds, she said, they think they're being helpful talking about the menopause and it's so it's really unkind <laughs> and I think it's just and I and maybe mm. it, they're not being helpful obviously and they're not but they're not being malicious they're being ignorant and to still be as as you said to still be hearing that from women I I you know mm. four years we've been going around talking about it I was quite surprised that you know just two days ago someone said the men in my office are making fun of me for having hot flushes what do I say to them mm. I mean you know it's not good well, and it happens all the time, doesn't it? You know, the nice menopause guidance came out seven years ago. You know, yesterday I saw someone in the clinic who told me the GP said, you've just got to get through it. There isn't any treatment. Yeah. So yeah. It, it, the, the impact it's having is still, we've got to amplify. And I think, you know, the work that people are doing in different ways is really important. Um, but it's allowing people to have what's right for them. I think now it's become so toxic in some areas that it's almost like well you all Louise does is push HRT well actually no I'm not I'm just allowing women to have a choice and that's really important and it's the same with you know your work the books everything is you can choose to read the book you can choose to listen to any podcast we're not ramming mm. it down people's throats but actually what we are realizing is that we're it's like picking up a stone and seeing everything underneath and then you pick up more and more and you realize that we we're just opening something that's not been allowed to be open before. Um, and it's actually very liberating, but I, I spend times feeling that I'm quite naughty doing what I'm doing. 
but it's quite <laughs> liberating as well for those people that we can reach. And and at the week last weekend, uh, you very kindly invited me to to be part of your it's the most amazing conference. Well, conference, not really co- event festival. I think we called uh, it in the end. Yeah, yeah we like fest- yeah. festival. Was it a festival? Yeah, we, but it was. It was. It was. What was really interesting to be. They're witnessing. Obviously, you had what eighty speakers. I, I mean, this we is your 95 first ninety-five speakers. Event. Yeah, everything. It was first oh big God. midlife so, event for midlife women. Yeah. Yeah. So most people, when they do their first event, they said we wouldn't call it a festival. Their first event, it would be something quite small that you do. Yes, but we didn't, yeah. you just suddenly decided to do like the biggest event ever. <laughs> so ninety-five speakers. How many? How many people came? About two thousand, was it? Why well, we're still. We're doing a what they call a mop up <laughs> on it this week. Yeah, no, oh, yes. more than two thousand, I think. Yeah, so it was a ticketed okay. thing with you know different rooms, and you know we kind of hoped that women would would want to go to everything, and it was hard to program it. And I, but you know we would have a room mm. full of three hundred, four hundred people when we were interviewing. But the other rooms with careers, parenting, and all there's so much yes. thirst out there for knowledge about mm. this stage of life, and and people just don't aren't talking about it they tend to talk about it in terms of a career or the crisis that people go through but it isn't really a crisis mm. is it it's a it's an opportunity and you you it's no. good to know everything but, uh, but and i felt that there there was this opportunity because there was this opportunity to do a bit of shopping i was looking at the people doing face um massage face gym, and i thought yes, oh, i'd love yes. to be there but so many people recognize me i just had to keep going hiding but there were lots of and it and it was a real joyous occasion actually and i felt that Sometimes you go to these events and you're all in your own little cocoon and you're doing your thing, but everyone was looking around and smiling and sharing and, you know, mm. it, it was as if they were friends coming together and that's a community that you and Trish have magically created and you must have been so proud of how it went because it really was We were immensely proud, actually, because almost everyone we talked to was very tearful by the end of the conversation. They were tearful because... Mm. They'd, you know, if we hadn't listened to you, we wouldn't have seen our GPs, we wouldn't be on HRT. We had a, a mm. woman who said she would have left her. I mean, you've heard these stories again and again. I would have left my marriage. Mm. I would have left my job. We had, we met two firefighters, female firefighters who came to find us to tell us that uh, I think it's Staffordshire Fire Service had paid for them to go to the festival because they wanted to get some information on mm. how to talk to women about what they were going. They wanted these two members of the team to be experts on it so could they go and get and I thought that's kind of incredibly amazing actually that you know this has become part mm-hmm. of a conversation in a very practical way and we had um women we we met some women from the Facebook group as well actually who are very interactive and we have some experts on the group who are tagged and they help out where they can and they were all saying the same things. We've come with our friends. This is just so lovely. We had a woman come from Norway who came on her own and she'd put on the Facebook yeah. group please will someone come and uh, chat to me because I'll sit in the cafe and I've come all this way on my own. It's my first holiday that I've had on my own, but I've been through a hor- horrific menopause. <laughs> so I'd quite like to meet other women. And honestly, to see them all back up around her and say, yeah, we'll meet you at 10 o'clock. We'll take, you know, well, you can come to this talk with me. It was mm. a real sort of gathering of, you know, stylish, like-minded, Gen X, mostly mm. Gen X. So there were quite a few younger women, actually. Women who just mm. really wanted to support each other, get information and just get on with living their best lives. It, it felt really powerful, but also very teary. And I'm sure you you had the balance team there. And I know when I talked to them, they said they'd had lots of women in tears um, about what was going on and how well, they yeah, were doing Yeah, especially, with- especially when... when- when we did the, um, mm. you were interviewing me, and then afterwards we both said, "Go to the balance <laughs> uh, lounge." And the, I had a couple of doctors there, and they were completely swamped. But but it is this, it, it's a two way thing. I think there's a there's a real mixture. There's those women who are so grateful, and I hear it a lot from women with the utmost respect, saying, "You know, you've saved my life, you've saved my marriage, you've saved my job," and not. Some of them are patients, but a lot of them is just because they've got the realisation and they've gone and got the treatment they want. But then there's those others who you can tell by looking at them, they're absolutely almost distraught because they're realising what's happened to them. It's that Mm. light bulb moment. And it's that fear and panic and desperation. How am I going to get help? I can't get help. And I, it's almost like a form of torture that's happening for some women because they, they know what's going on. They really know what treatment they want and they can't get it. And those are the people that are still there. And and obviously a lot of the work we're doing is trying to Mm. help give them a voice, give them confidence so they're not alone. So they can 
become better advocates so they can go and see the right healthcare professional to get the treatment that they want. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the the key. Sure. You can say to, you you need HRT or you need to do this that that whatever your lifestyle changes, but you've still got to find the right doctor. You got to take someone with you. You've got mm. to take in your list of your symptoms because the chances are you're not a going to get the right dose or the right information. It's a, it's a shame. I know most GPs are really trying their hardest, but there's a whole chunk of GPs who are not trying their hardest. You you you've got to be strong enough to say I don't want antidepressants. You've really got to, and, and we know for years, don't we, that women have gone in to have things like smear tests and other things that are phenomenally painful and we've just put up with that <laughs> because we've been told that's mm. what women you know that's how women should be treated so I think you have to be quite brave you've then got to navigate getting your prescription and only paying for it once you've got to get that all sorted as well you've got to navigate going back after three months you've got to get it. but it's it's harder than just getting the help we and you, you can see that sort of confusion and desperation in people's faces can't you sometimes when they say I just I'm I don't yeah. know what to do and then you know, they've got to find out about testosterone. Then they've got to find out about the shortages and where they can and cannot get things. So it still feels like a bit of an upward battle. While we know the words and the language and the information, we're still struggling to get mm. it, I think. Mm. I spoke to a woman on Monday night at an event, um, and when I explained why that misleading survey 21 years ago i just her mouth just dropped open and i can she said mm. i can't i can't believe that what what you mean i could have been she was in her 70s and she said so i could have taken hrt so i so i would have been okay mm. she said i went through the most awful time and i could have been i said mm. yeah you you could you could <laughs> and it's terrible isn't it yeah it is awful. It's absolute. So we need to change it for not just for our generation, but for future generations yeah. as well. So very grateful for your time today, Lorraine. Thank you. Before you go, three take home tips, of course. So I'd just like three reasons why um, people listening should go and buy your book. Okay. Right. Well, the first reason is it will make you <laughs> laugh, which I think is like the main thing we need, to, you know, because we do turn mm. to humour in midlife. And the second reason is, you know, if there's an expert... <clears throat> a leading expert i've interviewed them so they it, the information is there so the language is there for you to use if mm. you want to um change your life and the third reason is is this is about the emo this book's about the emotional side of midlife so you'll you'll get the practical information but you'll also get what's going on with you inside and it's about forming your own identity and we don't talk about that enough but the identity of women as they change as they go through this very powerful part of life it's really important and you don't want to you don't want to get it wrong you don't want to make mistakes and you will read stories of other women who've gone through it so you'll be able to see if what they experience will be helpful to you i hope that helps very good so Thank it's available you. on amazon all good bookshops including daunt's my favorite yes. bookshop in the world so <laughs> um thanks ever so much and keep going with your work you thank you Louise. Phenomenal thank you for duo. leading so the revolution so much, Rain. <laughs> thank you for more information about the perimenopause and menopause, please visit my website, balance-menopause.com, or you can download the free Balance app, which is available to download from the App Store or from Google Play. <laughs>